What's up fellas? We're looking at a new design here. I got bored. I don't have the materials to build this device. This is off of a replication of this unit here. Um, this unit here worked phenomenal. It worked so well we broke the sound barrier when it comes to the combustion burner world. You can see that blue hydro, that orange hydrogen flame there. And this thing was an absolute beast. We did things with this burner that you just can't do. You cannot melt manganese steel in a crucible in a forge with conventional combustion systems. I've tried it. You can barely melt cast iron. So this is a new test device and unfortunately we are not making hydrogen here. You can tell by the color of the metal. And you see that blue flame shooting out the front of the burner and the 2000 degree temperature? Yeah, that's a dead giveaway that we're not. So for a lot of the people who are saying that the color of the flame was due to the hot metal, that's I knew that wasn't true. Um, that orange flame we were seeing was from hydrogen. See here we're at 2,300 degrees, which is indicative of natural aspirated combustion burners. You usually can't get much hotter than 2,400 with one of these. And you can see here we're just not doing it. It's, it's a total failure. It's a flop. That red hot line is about 700 Celsius, and it's not hot enough to convert to hydrogen. We are producing a bunch of methane, but I'm not trying to burn methane or ethylene. I, I want to burn hydrogen for that 4,000 degree temperature that we need to pull off these high temperature crucible melts. You see, some people want to melt glass or e-way sludge, and this burner right here can do all of that. It can melt glass, e-way sludge, it can melt things that require a 3,000 degree melting point. Pretty awesome little piece of kit, but it destroyed itself in an hour because the metable is incompatible with a highly reducing environment provided by hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas is a reducing agent. You see here, we're about to dump some manganese drill bits, some M42, I think it was. So this right here is an achievement, melting M42 drill bits, the cobalt drill bits. This right here is not hydrogen gas. Look at that carbon flying out though. We might be getting a dab of hydrogen, and that's what we're seeing there is carbon. But um, we're, we're in the 900 Celsius regime, which means we're only cracking the propane into methane. So if this would have been the burner I put in the last video, all of the thunderfooting comments would have made sense. I would have shut my mouth and just dealt with it. But um, it's not what happened. Um, I was getting refuted with a working unit. This unit does not work. We did not make any hydrogen worthy of noting it. So you can see there we're only orange hot. We need that lemon. Kind of got mixed feelings about that test. It was a failure, but it did prove I was right. Not that I care. I mean, not, I don't want to be right for the sake of being right. I, I want to be right so I'm not stupid. It's a big difference. So this time around, we just weren't getting those yellow, hot, white, hot metals. The color was uh, an orange, bright red, orange. Okay, fellas, so you see here we have our color emitter chart. We need to be in the lemon regime to do what I'm trying to do. And that's what we were able to do with the 16 gauge inner can liner. We're operating in this regime now. We are, we're basically in the methane regime. We're converting propane to methane in this region right here. And that's it, maybe some ethylene in there. So we just don't have the air. I think I need to hook a different air compressor up maybe. Maybe I need to redesign the combustor. The back end doesn't seem to get as hot as the other units did. Also, maybe the co-flow heat exchange was a bad idea. Maybe I should have went counter flow. Either way, we're not getting the temperatures needed. This rail getting red hot. You know, it's kind of neat to look at, but it's, sorry, not hot enough. It also shows us we're going to need a cooling line. So we've got some design changes that need to be made. I think I'm just going to go ahead and um, draft up a design that has this line here, vaporizing the propane. 
so it comes in contact with the vaporizer coil. Just another preliminary test here. This wasn't supposed to solve all the problems. I knew we needed to cool that hydrogen off, but I just wanted to do it one more time. This test is mainly focusing on the proposition of using the eighth inch stainless inner plate. The exterior of this is 16 gauge. The interior is 11 gauge, which is three millimeters thick. I don't know why I even bothered now, because now I think about it, because you can't run stainless steel in a reducing environment at those temperatures. Reducing environments can be just as bad as oxidizing environments in some cases. Absolutely, my friend. In fact, we're going to go with Inconel 600, which has a 2,200 degree operating temperature and reducing and oxidizing environments. So we'll see what the price of Inconel is. We need a thousand Celsius to pull this reaction off. So I'm going to try this bigger air compressor. I don't know if that's going to work or not. We're currently using this one right here which is only like a one to two horsepower. It's a four banger, but when you've got a small electric motor, we'll give this one a shot. We'll probably have to do it tomorrow. I don't know yet. So this gave us a perfect shot of the blue flame from a burner that's not producing hydrogen. I'm going to compare that with the flame where we were making hydrogen, um, just for the sake of wrapping this whole thunderfoot thing up i got a d thunderfoot here so we did not achieve hydrogen gas in this test we just didn't do it i don't think we made any hydrogen maybe 10 percent but you got to get up to like 800 c before you start to crack propane into methane 700 800 c propane cracks to methane then from there, you start to get the other um, breakdowns. So the disassociation to hydrogen and carbon from ethylene and propylene and all that, whatever it is. But yeah, that's disappointing, man. That's really disappointing, but it proves a great point. It shows us what we can't do now. So guys, in order for this concept to work, we're gonna need an Alinko or monometal interliner can of 16 gauge metal. It has to be 16 gauge or 18 gauge in order for it to get hot enough. Thicker metal does not get as hot. I'm not exactly sure why in some cases it, it should under these circumstances, but it doesn't. You can see here that we had that hydrogen line red hot. Well, it wasn't hot enough. And it did show me one thing. We need to cool this line off. When we're running liquid propane, that will happen somewhat right there. But um, yeah, that's a shame, guys. I think if we turn the air up higher, we could probably get it to nuke over. Um, there was some popping taking place, which was probably carbon getting through. So we were producing a dab of hydrogen, and when it would pop, it would light the whole shop up like really bright. Hopefully I'll be able to get a still frame of that popping when a piece of carbon would fly through. The carbon's burning white, white hot, not orange or none of that other stuff. So I don't know what I want to do from this point. Thinking about trying the other air compressor real quick. See if that was a limitation. Because in the other tests, well, hold on. We used that air compressor in the first hydrogen test we did. I'll have to double check the old footage I believe using the 11 gauge metal is what prohibited the production of hydrogen in this test. The 11, 11 gauge metal is just too thick. It's not allowing us to get up to those temps that we need for the hydrogen production. It was a bright red, medium orange heat. So we'll take a look at a temperature correlation chart, which is one of the best ways to gauge temperatures by color because the temperature is independent of the emitter source. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's 900 degrees, it will glow with a 900 degree glow, whether it's steel, concrete, glass. That's one of the cool things about emitter physics. So 
I'm gonna post this and uh, the guys who were on board with me in the last couple of videos who were in agreement with the science, um, we'll discuss this in the comments. And all the Thunderfoots, I'm not even gonna feed them anything. I'm just not gonna respond to any more Thunderfoot comments. If it's really bad, I gotta delete it because people come to my channel to replicate my work, to find answers. And the comments are often one of the best sources of information out there. You know, get an engineer or a chemist in there and he just blows the cover on the whole deal sometimes um, or reveals something that you, you were looking for that wasn't present in the video. So for that reason, I curate my comment section, okay? There is no freedom of speech in science. Anything that is wrong should be vigorously rejected. Now, if it's bad science, then yeah, um, that's, that's what we're gonna reject but we're not gonna reject the good stuff. Like with the COVID thing and all that, that was all rejectable bull crap. Those were not real scientists. The second you start lying to people and spouting off at the mouth, non-facts, you're no longer an intellectual. You are a deceiver or an, a moron, one or the other.